Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cornerstone Podcast. I'm your host, Claire Hainke, and today we will be talking with author Robert Miltner and editor Gabby McClung to discuss Robert's new book, Ohio Apertures, which is coming out very soon with the Cornerstone Press. And without further ado, let's get into the conversation. Hi, Robert. Welcome to the podcast and welcome back, Gabby. It's so nice to have you both on today. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Hi, thank you. And we are delighted to have both of you. So this is Robert Miltner and he is the author of Ohio Apertures, which is the next book coming up from Cornerstone Press at UWSP. So Robert, if you just want to introduce yourself briefly so everyone listening can get to know who you are. Oh, I'm doing the the, cap, the encapsulated uh, in, uh, in introduce myself. Uh, let's see, I've lived in Ohio most of my life. I retired from Kent State two years ago, where I taught creative writing and literature. Uh, I've been writing. <laughs> I started writing. I tried to write song lyrics when I was 15 for a band I was in, and I was an epic failure with that. I went from there into starting to write poetry. It was a logical movement. And uh, so I, I wrote as a poet for a long time doing pretty standard lyrical poetry. I've done a a book of short stories, uh, two books of full-length books of poetry, a a stack of little chapbooks, and and now this, which is, so this is a new genre for me, and I'm really delighted to to be finding what I can say in this new genre. I've been of late thinking a lot about the influence of place. There's a great quote by the poet Charles Olson who says, always the geography leans on me. And I I love that. It's a real, a great encapsulation. And so um, it's interesting to think about oneself as site-based or shaped by and influenced by the geography we grow up in. And so I'm Midwest, lower Midwest, North Coast, lower end of Lake Erie, and that's, that's my territory. I think that defines me in a lot of ways, and I think that's what, uh, what my book is about, considering all those influences. Like, is there anything else you want to know about me? <laughs> no, that, I mean, obviously we would love to know everything about you, but uh, that is a great introduction. Um, hey, and then Gavin, do you just want to remind everyone who you are? Yeah, uh, I'm Gabby McClung. I am the semester's editor-in-chief of Cornerstone Press. This is my third semester. And for uh, Ohio Apertures, I was the managing editor. Yes, and once again, we are happy to have you back on now with a promotion. Both of you obviously have been working on Ohio Apertures for quite some time. Can you tell me a little bit about how that process worked, um, working with the book, with the press? Gabby, would you like to go first? (laughs) Sure. Um, <clears throat> so this working on Ohio, Ohio Apertures was a really incredible experience for me because it was stepping outside of my uh, comfort zone with things that I was used to editing. Because the first collect, uh, collection I edited was Responsible Adults, so it was uh, fiction. And so I hadn't really dived into memoir. I didn't really meet, read memoir. And so I had to do a lot of research on my own time and kind of figure out what direction I needed to go in and what things I needed to focus on. And I learned so much from the experience that I will definitely bring into my professional writing career after school. And yeah, it was just such an incredible experience and you're an incredible writer. Thank you. My experience uh, has been wonderful. Um, This is the second book I've had with the press that uh, is at a university and uh, the bulk of the people involved are students. I did that in my first book of poetry, Hotel Utopia, which was from uh, uh, Minnesota State, Moorhead. And I love this process. It's, it fits so much of what I've done as a, a professional educator for 40 years, 30 at Kent State and 10 years doing high school. I love the interaction of getting so many different viewpoints um, from people who, who, who know the subject matter or don't. The feedback's ter- terrific. Uh, the style I'm using, the genres, where I'm pushing genres. I, I had so much amazing feedback, and I could, and I got great suggestions. Because I get to things like, I don't understand what you're saying here, and I'm going, but I understand what I'm saying here. <laughs> so I had some great rewrites. I had so many helpful comments, and I love, I love when I would just see these little things, little little statements with a little question mark, like, you know, what, what 
this, with this. So it, I, I, I just find the process great. And I, I love the interaction with it. I've worked with um, Bottom Dog Press, uh, which is Ohio's largest independent press with my book of short stories and your bird can sing. And it was basically the editor and the editorial assistant. That was it. It was all by email. And there's a difference in the process. I really like being involved in the give and take and the discussion. And it's an enriching experience for me. I feel like I haven't just put a book out, but um, I'm learning as well as making the book. And that is really enriching for me. So um, it's just been terrific. It's just been a terrific experience. I feel like wow, this is like, they should, I, I wish I could always get this kind of attention when I'm doing a book. <laughs> yeah, everybody, I, I, so many people are asking me, uh, you know, we're going to do this. How, how can we help? So I, I just, it's like, a, there's a, commu I've, I've entered into a community rather than just a single person and their assistant. And that's not any criticism of, uh, of Larry Smith at Bottom Dog Press, because that's a terrific Ohio press. It really is. But this experience has just been terrific for me. Well, on behalf of all of the press, thank you. That was so kind of you to say. I think uh, that community aspect that you talked about, I've definitely felt it. I'm not, I've never been part of the like editing portion of the press. Um, before this semester, I was the director of operations, forgot my own title there for a second. Um, so I mainly helped with uh, the press and with the PR side marketing yeah. and book launch mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, so yeah. I was pretty much only involved in things after it was all done. So I yeah. love getting to do these podcasts and like actually mm -hmm. like learn about the editing portion of it. And mm -hmm. I, it, I think that getting to spend most of our time on like one or two books at a time, I think really helps with that individual attention and community aspect that you talk about. Because as you said, like other presses are probably probably working with more books than we are. And that lends itself to maybe not, they just don't have the time that to get into that doesn't mean that they don't work as hard but it's definitely a unique thing that we have here and we're all very grateful that we get to share it with your book i've asked this of previous previous authors that we have worked with was there a specific piece uh in ohio apertures that you thought went under like the most change after working with the student press and how do you think that process went wow that's a really good question um it's the piece toward the end uh, about uh, the Cinemagical Film Festival <laughs> because I rewrote like the first two pages of that and I was so pleased with what I ended up with and I think I did a revision and then a revision and I think I did a final revision and the final one it absolutely clicked for me and I also uh, someone asked I had a little one of those little marginal comments with a question mark it says I think you're getting a little hard on Detroit here <laughs> going Really? So I really revisited that and I thought, yeah, I, and I hadn't meant to, I was, it was carrying over from seeing this film called Detropia, right, which was about decay and the loss of um, population in Detroit. I mean, this is a city that did not, the, the, the city of Detroit does not have a single chain supermarket, actual city of Detroit. The data in it was just startling and they talked about people who uh, worked in the auto industry and you know the whole history of Detroit. I, I carried over in the early drafts of how that was meshing with my perceptions of Detroit, which I've been to many times. It's on the other, it's on the west end of the lake, like Buffalo's on the east end of the lake for me. And um, it, it, it made me rethink that. And um, I was really happy that that question came up because I was uh, able to uh, pull back from the influence of the movie and draw more from my own experiences and see connections that um, connected Cleveland to Detroit in ways rather than what I was, the film was presenting, but the film was designed for shock value. It's a shocking thing that's been happening there. Um, I think that piece, and that's a, that was one of the earlier pieces of uh, nonfiction that I wrote, actually. I, I, I worked with a small press called Buried Letter Press that a friend of mine, Matt Mackey, had started. 
And uh, he said, you know, send me some stuff. I go, yeah, can I try some creative nonfiction? He says, yeah, sure. And so I just, that's was, that was a great support for me. I was like a contributing editor and I could try things, I could explore, and it was this remarkable experience. And so um, that was a cultural piece I was doing on the film festival, which is the big one in Cleveland. That piece has gone under, has undergone lots of drafts since the start, but I'm a person who goes through a lot of drafts. You know, I, I, I tend to overwrite and then scale back, um, which I think is, for me, that works the best. I'd, I'd rather put it out there and take out what's excessive or repetitious. Um, and edit things for effect later. So yeah, that was, I think, one of the pieces that just was really um, terrific, the, the editing I got on that. So pleased for the, the uh, input I had on it. Gabby, do you remember editing that story at all? I think I do. I do remember that one towards the end. <laughs> yeah. uh, were there any pieces, Gabby, that you think went, that you saw go over the most change? Not that I can think of specifically, but I do have some favorite pieces in mind. I ooh, think, ooh, what? yeah, I think, I believe it's called Tasting the New Moon. It's towards the beginning, the one with the croissants. My, <laughs> it was my favorite. I loved that story so much. That's it kind of had this like essay-ish feel, but it was personal yeah. and it still had that, that essence of a, of a memoir. Yeah. And that's one of the stories that I felt like you were really experimenting and pushing the boundaries with what you could kind of do with the genre. Yeah. And I absolutely loved that, that story. Boy, I can't tell you how many, that, that went through lots of drafts before it got into the book. And that went into an anthology called The Boom Project, which was uh, uh, for the boom generation living along a specific part of the Ohio River. <laughs> I wound up in, and um, that was published in there for the first time. And uh, I did a lot of edits on it for that. And then I put it in the book and um, yeah, pinch, pinch, tighten, tighten, you know, expand this, explain this. Yeah, I, I thank you for liking that piece. It's, it's, I, it's my wife's favorite, it's my favorite. So it's, um, yeah. So you picked the right favorite, Gabby. <laughs> what, what did she win? <laughs> <laughs> so Gabby, I'm curious to get your opinion, just overall, what's the vibe? of Robert's book um, as an editor. Um, we've heard him talk about it, which is great, but I'm curious as to like a reader, what would they think of it? Let's see, I, I actually had to write a little brief summary for the, I think it's the press release or the one cheater we're doing for it. And I was like, how do I describe this book? Because there's so much, it encompasses so much that I feel like it's really important and powerful and interesting and I, I've had trouble summarizing it in just two sentences because I feel like there's so much that you want to pull out and be like, oh, and this was incredible and this was great. And I think that it gives the, the Midwest and obviously Ohio and specifically a new life um, because I, uh, I've moved around a lot. I grew up in the South and then I've lived on the West Coast. I lived in California. My parents currently live in Washington. Um, and then I ended up in Wisconsin. And so I've been all over the place and seen so many different like little microcultures of different states. Yeah. And so the Midwest is still very new to me. And I felt like this book just kind of captured exactly what it means to be a Midwesterner and how important that identity is to people. So yeah, I thought it was just a very peaceful grounding book that kind of encapsulates uh, what it means to be from the Midwest. Wow, thank you. That's that's great. <laughs> and now I'm curious. To do. I'm sorry, no. No. <laughs> this is a trend for us. Robert and I keep on talking over each other. <laughs> <laughs> We're just so excited to talk. It's a good thing. Um but Robert, I'm curious after hearing that, um, obviously people will get this understanding when they read your book, but can you give us a little snippet of what you think being a Midwesterner is. Wow. Yeah, that's, um, well, we're the future because when all the coasts sink, we're going to be what's left. So it's the place to be. <laughs> Morbid, <laughs> but I guess positive for us. <laughs> the Midwest is, uh, I think it's an undervalued region. It's, uh, there's upper and lower. 
and it's it's kind of like um i don't know north and south carolina or virginia and west virginia they're just splits of the same thing to a large degree it was the frontier at one time uh, the the eastern colonies crossed the ohio river and and that was the beginning of everything out there the rivers were the highways the the lakes were the highways and it's subtle <laughs> midwesterners are uh uh, they're not outrageous. They're 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 polite. They're, you think they're Canadian? They're so polite. There's an evenness. There's a a, a, a balance. Uh, I don't think Midwesterners are quick to form opinions. We're rooted in the Midwest to the land because the Midwest is is the great agricultural the beginning of the great agricultural production, and. We have lakes and rivers and, and, and Appalachian mountains. And um, I mean, like Youngstown, for example, which is a former steel city is technically classified as an Appalachian region. <laughs> so the, I, I like the mixes on it and the way that there's these interior uh, shots about it. Uh, and I think that the pace of life in the Midwest is slower and it, 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 it creates a more uh, deliberative uh, sense of, of motion and decision making. And it's also kind of rooted in, well, we've always done this. And you know, we'll, if we change, we're going to take a couple of small steps. <laughs> I mean, that's just very Midwest. It's not like um, the huge influence of tradition in New England. Um, my wife and I were in New England the last two years doing writing residencies. We were in, we were in New York, we were in Vermont, we were in uh, Massachusetts, and we had hardly been there. These beautiful little towns with a gorgeous church and an even more gorgeous library. You know, and it's like, wow. I mean, the sense of getting the culture and what you're rooted in. The Midwest thing is like, okay, here you go. It's like you can see so far because it's so flat. <laughs> But it gives you a long vision. It's, it gives you a long vision, you know. And I lived in Colorado and I love the mountains. What you can see from the top of those mountains is a completely different thing because you're looking down. Uh, but the, the great flatness is, is I think, uh, a leveler. What it means, though, for a writer is that um, I don't have to hurry. I can move at my own pace. I needn't race. Um, I can be... Um, I can make a statement and feel comfortable because it's not just something I picked up on a podcast and I'm saying it now because I like the way it sounded. <laughs> okay, it come, it's rooted in something. So there's a stability to that, I think. And um, great writers have come out of it. Ohio has produced fabulous writers. So yeah, I guess that's my take on the Midwest. I think that's absolutely true, especially what you said about the politeness aspect of it and I'm sure Gabby can add on this too but I've my family's been big travelers and I studied abroad in London two years ago and oh, nice. I, that culture shock of just like in the Midwest everyone will hold open a door for you no matter how far away you are not yeah. the case in London mm -hmm. um so Gabby, I'm curious, what's your experience? Um, you said you're fairly new to the Midwest. So I'm kind of curious what your opinion of it is. Yeah, I guess it, it's pretty similar. So I grew up in Tennessee and spent most of my life there. And I'd moved around in the South a little bit. And then in high school, I moved to uh, California and went to a giant high school there and then moved to Chicago and went to an even bigger high school there. And then I moved to a little town called Stockbridge, Wisconsin. It's on Lake, uh, Lake Winnebago. And uh, it's about an hour and a half in point. And it's tiny. And I live two minutes from the school and I still didn't have a Stockbridge out address. And so I, had, I thought that the town that I grew up in in Tennessee was small and it was not. Um, and so I went to this school and it was a K through 12 and I was like, I don't know about this. Like, this is really small. Like my graduating class was going to have like a thousand kids in it when I was in California. I was like, I don't know if I want to go to this school. Like maybe there's some bigger ones. And my mom was like, well, it's close. So you might as well just go see it and we'll, we'll see what happens. And as soon as I walk in the door, seven kids come up to me and they're like we'll give you a tour like oh my gosh this is so exciting we don't get new kids and they're dragging me around the school and teachers are talking to me like oh my gosh it's gonna be so great to have you you're gonna be in this class with me and these are gonna be your classmates and I was like well I guess I'm going to school here now 
welcome to the Midwest. Yeah, <laughs> right. And it was one of the so Midwest. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. And it was it was a really great experience though. And I've only been in the I think I've been in the Midwest for four almost five years now, which is the longest time I've lived in a place after moving around so much. But it doesn't feel like I've been here that long. Like kind of like Robert said, like life here is slow and um, the pace kind of calms down a bit, which I didn't get at all growing up jumping from place to place, but it doesn't make, you kind of live a whole lifetime. You live a bunch of like mini lifetimes. Yeah. And um, so even though I've been here for so long and when I think about it, like zooming out, I'm like, wow, it's been a really long time that I've been here. It doesn't feel like it's been that long. And I still feel like there's so many new mm -hmm. things that I learn about the Midwest and so many experiences I've yet to have. Um, yeah. But yeah. Excellent. So besides the Midwest, Robert, I know that one of your other passions is this genre that you've been working in, the lyric memoir. Yeah, and yeah. you've spoken a little bit about this and I can tell you're very excited to talk about it. So just <laughs> tell me about lyric memoir. It's, it, it's, it's like uh, what they call uh, an occasional bird that uh, gets off the, 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 uh, the migration routes and some exotic bird will show up in Chicago, <laughs> you know, 80 people run to the park to get a picture of it before at least. Um, the genres have been changing so much and, and uh, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move this back and date this to um, 70s and, and 80s with the accessibility of personal computers because um, anybody who had a computer could start a literary magazine for nothing. You just build a website and you start a journal. And so what happened was and I'll backtrack a little bit, but I want to start with this point is that the American sonnet is the typical American poem that occupies one page in a literary journal. <laughs> it's small, it's concise. You flip every page has a new poem on it, except for one or two that run longer. That wasn't true in the 70s and 80s with fiction. Fiction was still long. You could do the big stories. Uh, Nonfiction were big, big pieces at the time. And uh, what happened with the rise of the PC in these small online journals was that fiction got smaller because the goal was to scroll down or to click the next on the list and you saw a piece of prose that, that was a page, a single or a screenshot, okay? So this, this gave rise to the prose poem, which I've moved into and is, is an incredible hybrid form. It's so insanely exciting. But I came to that, I, I went from verse poetry to prose poetry, and then I was doing a narrative prose poem, and uh, I, I suddenly said, well, this is a story. This is a story. I just wrote a story. And I knew somehow something was different. I'd crossed that line from prose poetry, and I went from poetry to prose poetry to prose, <laughs> okay? And I was fascinated with the micro fictions and the flash fictions and the hundred word stories and the way that you could pack so much. They were like small riddles practically. I love the form. Um, and a lot of those pieces um, are in my book, um, also a very Midwest book, um, And Your Bird Can Sing. I, I started doing memoir unintentionally because I, I started doing these travel pieces. I discovered the haibun, which is a form, ready for this. These are travelogue prose poems written in the eight, 19th century in Japan uh, by Matsuo uh, Basho, who uh, at 70 decided to walk the perimeter of Japan and had to invent a new form to write about it. So he'd write prose and then he'd end them with a little haiku, right? And I started doing, when, when I travel, I, I, I go to museums and I constantly write in a notebook. I don't write in a notebook when I'm home, but when I travel, I always do. And so I started doing these sort of travelogue pieces and the, the, uh, the croissant piece, it has a lot of that moving around, but I was stitching them together with the croissant. Uh, what a glue. Um, so I began to explore then the idea of, uh, of getting nonfiction down and exploring well, what are the different things I can do. So some of my pieces are very narrative. Some of them are kind of meditative. But I discovered the idea of memoir, these brief memoirs, uh, by reading uh, um, N. Scott Mamaday's book, 
uh, the name of which escapes me at the moment. It's, it's a piece about his grandmother who was a uh, Kiowa. He's Native American. And he would do, uh, 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 he would do a, a, a mythical piece, uh, a historical piece, and then a personal statement. And when asked about that, he said, well, I think they're memoirist prose poems. And I'm going, what? That's a whole new kind of prose poem. So I started to drift over there and then they started to expand or get shorter. And I like this form a lot. And uh, in prose poetry, I'm able to not write lyrically. You see, think about in poetry, when I use the pronoun I, it's clear to anybody reading it, this is me talking, right? It's like the difference between an autobiography and a biography. Uh, autobiography is subjective. It's me, I, the I speaks. And then of course, in a, a, a biography, somebody else is uh, doing it objectively. So we get to this idea then of the, the memoirs, non, brief nonfiction, and with the so-called lyrical essay, and some of the lyrical essays in my book are, are the piece about Virginia Woolf and those auditory pieces. The, the croissant piece is a, a braided woven essay. And so I start to experiment with the idea then if I write lyrics and I can be lyrical in writing poetry and prose poetry, and I go over here into nonfiction, which is the other place where the I is, is myself, am I writing lyrical flash memoir? And then like, you know, the clouds part, the sunshine, Tommy says, yes, Robert, that's true. <laughs> but it's a fascinating, fascinating form. Um, and I have used it um, in classes. Uh, it's a great way to introduce people to, to, to write. You know, it's like, oh, I don't know what to write about. I'll write about your life. You know, and you can give some prompts and they learn to be comfortable saying what they want to say. But memoir, is, is interesting too, because, and there's a quote by Siebold at the end where he says, you know, in, in nonfiction, we're not really going for absolute truth. We're going for the poetic truth. And that's totally a statement about writing lyrical memoir, for example. So it's how I remember it. Somebody else could have the same experience and they'll remember it differently. And so, um, and a memoir is, uh, to just pick out a small section of it and let that speak of what's larger and resonate. It's, it's, like, it's like my favorite form of writing. It's so satisfying. And so the book, I didn't start out to, to do this book. I was just writing it. And then I started to realize that I started to gather the pieces that might make a book and push a lot of other pieces out. Um, and then the book came together. So it's a, it's a fascinating form. And um, I really love that it says that when you open the cover, it says lyrical memoir, because it's, um, it's a beautiful thing, really. As, as a writer, I'm so excited. Can you tell? <laughs> Absolutely. And I love it. I've, I've got billboards all over the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, obviously, you said that this is one of your favorite genres to work yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything that's more difficult writing nonfiction or writing specifically about your own experiences? Do you find yourself being more vulnerable than when writing fiction? Well, that's absolutely the idea. There actually, in, when I look now at my book of, of short stories, there's three or four pieces in there that could have easily gone into this book, but I'd already used them. <laughs> like I was writing before I knew what they were. Phrase that question for me again, because I just went off on a tangent there. Yeah, the so... I guess, what do you think is the difference between writing fiction or like fictional poetry versus writing something that you've actually experienced? Do you find it harder or easier because of the vulnerability that it requires? Well, the vulnerability is is the, the thing that happens. I mean, in a short story, uh, I speak through a character. If I write a play, I speak through a character. If I write nonfiction, I write my life. But not necessarily because there's journalism, which is connected to nonfiction. Some of the best nonfiction writers began as journalists. David Giffels, who's a, a friend of mine and a colleague through the Neo MFA, he worked at the Akron Beacon Journal for years and, and wrote crazy books on things like uh, rubber tires and Devo. <laughs> but he's, he's a phenomenal writer and he, he comes in the, the, the journalist's door. 
uh, but in nonfiction, uh, we can come in as poets because we know that I, we know, we know that we're confident, we know it's exposure, you know? And I think that there's, there's a risk in that that you have to get comfortable with, or you know that the risk is worth it. And so that's a challenge. The, the other thing is like negotiation. Okay, I'm in the genre, I'm doing this nonfiction, this is me, but how, how do I work this to get what I want? I, I think the heart, one of the hardest things for me in this book was when to be in the present and when to be in the past. Because some of the pieces that were early childhood memories, I wrote some of those in the first person like it was happening. And it's like, when I learned I could do that nonfiction, I clapped my hands. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I could do this, you know? So there's so much more to negotiate. There's a lot of negotiation that goes on because there's times it's like, I need to get something to tag this to in the real world, but I can't overdo it. So that's why I said I overwrite a lot and then pair back to what's the bare minimum I need to, to frame it. I've got a, um, it's like scene setting in fiction. You know, you can't just have, you know, the uh, introduction to fiction writing or introduction to creative writing. One of the more, more common things I would see as a teacher is someone would start a story like this. He slid the curtain open and looked down upon the city. <laughs> Wait, where are we? What floor are we on? <laughs> okay. Um, so there's that sense of you have to have enough setting to make it work. So there's a lot of negotiation. It basically, the negotiation is also an exciting and thrilling thing because creative nonfiction is uh, a relatively new genre as its own genre in the same way that prose poetry is a relatively new one, at least here. It's been in, in Europe since it was invented uh, by Charles Baudelaire. Uh, um, but the, the, that's enough, they're, they're, I find them closely related. I really do. The, the, the memoirist prose poem and the lyrical memoir are, um, they're not brothers, but they're cousins. <laughs> okay. So um, it's, uh, it's really thrilling for me to be able to assemble enough pieces in a way that each, what is it, Robert Frost once said, if you have a book of 24 poems, the book is the 25th poem, okay? And there, the, I have that feeling, it's how I know when a book is coming together, and I have a real sense that this, the book is the the final piece, it locks it all together. It's like putting type in a case and locking the case to print with it. Yeah, this is just a thrilling book for me. And it's a thrilling book that we get to publish. And I love hearing you talk about it because you're just clearly so passionate about it. <laughs> and Gabby. Boy, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, Gabby, I'm curious. How since you've worked on um, Responsible Adults, which was a book of fictional short stories, I'm curious how editing a nonfiction memoir was different than writing a fiction or editing a fictional storybook. Yeah, I kind of had to change gears in my mind. And before I had never edited anything that was uh, nonfiction. So I was a little nervous. I was like, I have no idea where to approach this from. And I was like, I don't want to not do it justice to so the biggest thing I did, which seemed to help Robert a lot, was ask a lot of questions. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's the way I kind of found, kind of yeah. helped guide things, because you can't be like, this character isn't working, or this scene doesn't make sense, because like, it's somebody's life, it's someone's real experiences, so those kind of things don't really translate, but asking questions like, um, how is this person important in your life, or um, what kind of happened in this place that made it so important to you? Those kind of questions yeah. uh, I found kind of helped guide things a little bit more. And uh, Colin and I did a lot of research and tried to help the team um, kind of figure out where to approach it from because a lot of them were like, I'm not really sure how to approach nonfiction. I'm not really sure. I'm not familiar with memoirs. I don't know what to do. So yeah. we did a lot of research and uh, we read through some of your stories and talked about them in some of our meetings just to kind of get a sense of here's the things that people are noticing and here's how to turn those into um, constructive feedback and, and good content edits that, that can be helpful to an author. Um, and so Colin did some research and found that like for memoirs, the first and last sentence is really important. So we did a lot of uh, focusing on those for a little bit. And once we kind of locked those little pieces 
into place where we're like, okay, this is how we kind of work our way around these stories and uh, kind of give feedback that will be helpful in this genre that we're a little unfamiliar with. And it was so valuable to me because you all represented anybody picking up the book for the first time. So you asked the questions that any reader would, and it helped me to focus on addressing a lot of those issues, which I think make the book more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the suggestions I was getting from all of you or like the order of the pieces and why is this here and what should I move around? What's the impact of that here? I discovered in the last final proof edits that I sent to Ross, I had three pieces that ended with the word future. <laughs> <laughs> how did, how, and I'm reading the proof, I'm going, how could this be true? <laughs> so, uh, and, and of course that's, straightened out now but I mean it's it's yeah it, it the feedback was just so so terrific because they were questions that sometimes it helps for me as a writer to be asked a question that I've on something maybe I've just kind of taken for granted or I'll go well I know why I did that because I did this and I'm going or did I <laughs> and what happens if I see that from here um yeah it's like uh it's like the difference between, you know, playing drums by yourself or starting a band, you know, because <laughs> when everybody's playing together, it, it, we, all, it, we all lift each other. And I had that sense in this, that everybody was contributing and I think it lifted the book, I really do. I was at the final point where, like, what is it, uh, Oscar Wilde once said, I, I, I had a very busy morning. I, I took two commas out and put them back in, <laughs> right? That <laughs> editing kind of a thing. So um, to get to that point for me is always where I can finally say yes and then move on to the next thing. Yeah. Terrific you, stuff. Oh, you asked me a lot of great questions. You really did. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's, that's Gabby. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, how would I answer that? Why is that there? <laughs> oh, but that's great, though. I like uh, the interaction and it is just fantastic. It really is. It feels like a group project. Yeah. That collaborative aspect is something I've said this before in previous episodes, but I'll say it again, because I think it's so true is how collaborative bookmaking really is. Like, obviously yeah. this is your work and these are your stories. This is your life, but yeah. the amount of change that things go through through the editing process and the people that make the book happen it's so much more like a movie than you would think it is in terms of how many people go into making it one of the things that i thought was the most helpful was like i didn't write this book intentionally i wrote the pieces and then i i cobbled together and i found for example I got a couple like, didn't Charlie say that? I'm going, oh yeah, if I said that here. So I'd have to catch myself at doing that. And um, the sequences of things, because mem memory and memoir, memoir is memory, so it's not chronological. One thing can take you back further before you move forward. And so, um, but by asking questions, when I settled on an answer, I was solid on that answer. And it, it, so it's like, are you sure about that? You know, are you sure you're gonna wear that with that? <laughs> Somebody goes, well, and you go, oh yeah, okay. And you see something. So um, yeah, invaluable, just invaluable to me. Great experience. So I'm curious, the story that uh, people will hear um, in a little bit after our conversation is over Valdemar Carr. Um, <laughs> I'm curious just to hear your thoughts about why you wanted to write about your like breaking down car. Well, it's, it's, um, I think I, I think I came across that story someplace, that Poe story, somebody referenced it and I'm going, I don't remember that one. And oh, in my, when I was a, an adolescent, I read a lot of Poe, who doesn't? I mean, they're thrilling stories. Uh, and so I didn't know that one and I read it and I'm going, this is really kind of interesting. And um, I was exploring the use of what's called um, the braided essay or woven essay. Where, and, and that's a perfect case. Uh, you know, it starts with a personal experience in, I took, I went into the past and narrated from the present. Let's start there. Then it jumps to uh, this, this car, okay? And then it jumps to Edgar Allan Poe. 
and, and it's jumping around. So we're in different time places and it's a thrilling thing. It's like juggling. Okay. You're juggling these pieces. And so there's a lot of movement, but it's also, you're dropping clues in each things. Everything leads to the end. I mean, that whole piece is what we call convergent. I put all the pieces in play to make them converge toward the ending. Now, I have the uh, structural thinking about stories and any narrative and any book the way a poet does. I organize a book of short stories or nonfiction the way I organize a book of poetry. And so I, I can bring that lyrical device of how to set things up for closure into writing these short pieces because they're, they're almost like a set of sequenced or juxtaposed small prose poems. Okay, but I did have that car and that's a true story. What I was thinking about um, the Valdemar story about uh, I'm dying, let me die. I thought, wow, I can remember I, that I had that, that key, I had that key thing with that car and I started thinking, I'm going, wow. So my car was a Valdemar car and I'm going, okay, I got to run with this one. So, so the beauty of that is I'm, I work at the beginning from just taking us into the past, but narrating it from that moment. It's like a flashback, but you're starting there. And then you jump to this thing that's research. Here's where the journalism comes in. I had to do all this research on, on the B-210, okay? And the shocks were that bad. <laughs> so, and then, but then to set it up, I had to get the Poe story in there. And then it started to get really fun because I'm beginning to see these threads I can stitch through. I, I didn't know how to end it. And then it took me a long time to find that last line. I felt duped. <laughs> and I use that refrain to echo something later. I felt something else in the same way. But I do a lot of repetitions and repetition variations because that's, uh, that's a very poetic technique that I can do. And it, anything that's lyrical, I, I can use my poetic license. Yeah. I'm curious, um, you talk a bit in that story about how Poe published that story as like a fake nonfiction, <laughs> like kind of a prank. Yes. Um, you tie it into the H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds um, broadcast, which is one yeah. of my favorite like media yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious as to why you decided to bring in that aspect of that story into that um, piece. I'm talking about a real car but I mean, talking about fiction, but fiction written almost as a kind of satirical nonfiction, right? So some of it's just being cheeky because it's fun. Some of it is because I want to, um, okay, if you're writing murder mysteries, there's a thing called a red herring. I don't know why, but a red herring means that you're telling a story and you drop a clue that can point that, that, that at the moment you go, that's that, that never works. And it turns out to be really important later when the, when the crime is solved. So sometimes I'm tossing out these little red herrings, you know? So it's like, is a hoax? Is this whole story a hoax? Was the car a hoax? The, the, the flying carpet was the like hoax when I saw it coming at me. <laughs> wow. So, um, I had a lot of stuff at play in that. And I like that. I like that. There's, it's like a theater where you've got characters coming on and off the stage. It's like a, a Christopher Durang play where anything's possible. People will just walk across the stage and say something while they're going. It's just really crazy. I, I, was in, I, play, I acted in a, uh, as a man who uh, had a stroke and couldn't speak. It's my acting career because I can't remember lines. And um, they put a sheet over me for five scenes <laughs> and then suddenly tore it off and I walked off the stage. It's like, so I have a sense of that, a little bit of the theater of the absurd uh, because I think that it's fun to play in nonfiction with mood and tone, you know? And so that hoax thing was like, how does that work? Because there was H.G. Wells and Orson Wells and then Edgar Allan Poe and the Wells as soon as they came across it, they're like, get them in there, get them both in there. And it's funny because one of my blurbers um, had, had sent me a note one day. He's gone, well, one of the Wells is spelled correctly. And that's all he said me just that, just that little note. And it's like, he's like, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just telling you once 
uh, sometimes I'm at play in some of these stories. I, I think the story that I enjoyed the most was the croissant story because I, I, I just really wanted to play in that one. And it's the, the longest because I was having so much fun playing. I didn't want to leave the playground, even though it was dinner time and my mom was calling. I wanted to stay there and play some more. I just now made the connection with the the whole hoax theme. And then at the end of the story, when you say, I felt duped. duped. <laughs> so that's brilliant. I think they did it all the time that didn't work for me with the cup. Seemed when that woman drove off that like, wait a minute, I sold it because of that. Now it's not happening. <laughs> and the splash of the coffee, like the splash of the person. I mean, it was so much fun to write. It really was. Lots of really good connections. I'm excited about this form. It's so um, playful. Gabby, I'm curious if you remember anything about editing um, Valdemar Carr, or if you remember anyone else saying anything about it and how that story changed during the editing process. That was another one of my favorite stories. I think I've just got a thing for the braided essay uh, style now, I think. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Now I'm kind of seeing, I'm like, maybe I should read more of that kind of (laughs) Because yeah. those are two of the stories that I really liked. And I remember a couple of the, the editors really liking um, that story as well. Yeah. Uh, and it's always really hard to edit a story that you like, because you're like, this is so much fun. I just love it so much. And then you're like, I don't want anything to change. It's perfect. But of course, there's always something to change and something to tweak. I find editing stories that I really like really challenging for that yeah. reason. And so we had to, I had to rely a lot on like getting other comments from other people. Mm-hmm. Like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, that's right. That might be uh, a little tweaking. I don't know how much it ended up changing from how it came to us, but I do remember getting a lot of uh, feedback back on that story and a lot of people really enjoying it. I think I cut it by about 10% based on some of the comments. And I think it sped it up a little bit. I think it moves faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was one of the early pieces that was published at Diagram, which was one of the first great online journals. It was still one of the, just a brilliant journal. And it was a real validating piece for me to be published there. I mean, it was one of the first ones I sent out outside of um, working with uh, my friend's journal. And uh, there's a couple in there from the Los Angeles Review that are some of my favorites. That opening piece of the, the airplane and the, oh, I got a taste about the airplane. <laughs> yeah, with the uh, going up to the, to the Lake Erie Islands. I thought I had all the information on the tin goose, that airplane. And then somebody called me out on it. And I'm going, wow. And then I started looking around and I found something else in some obscure airport museum someplace that had a picture and it was definitive that this is how many seats. <laughs> I, yep. I, I chased the seat uh, arrangement on that six or seven times to get it down to the app. It, 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 is liter- it was literally the shortest air flight in the country. I mean, literally, you could about row a boat across there and it lifted out of one field into another was the first plane I ever flew on. And it's hanging now at the, at the Smithsonian Institute. And I saw it there one time, one of the last times I'd been in Washington, I knew it was there and I went to see it. And there it was, the tin goose up there, the corrugated thing with the, you tie yourself into the seats with, <laughs> with the, the, the ropes you used to hang stuff on in the yard. I can't think of the word there, but uh, yeah, it's just, it's just amazing. It's a funny memory. I, re- I remember that edit, our, our fact checker was very thorough. And I remember she left a comment being like, actually, I think there's this many seats in the plane. Oh, yeah. So I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to get this. You're <laughs> like, dang it, I will find out. And I, I've been to the Smithsonian Institute. So I guess I've probably seen it and just didn't even know. Yes, yeah, so I, I knew what it was because I'm like, I was on that thing. Mm-hmm. It's the first time I flew. Imagine what it was That's like. crazy. After that. Yeah. <laughs> My first flight went out the window. <laughs> I remember joking, thinking at the time, you know, I was waving to see if people would wave back. I mean, it barely clears the trees and it drops some more and lands in the field. So there's a lot of memories with that. And it, I like starting the book with this amusement part because I wanted to start the book like, let's have some fun. Let's get on the roller coaster here. Let's go. So with that fact checking little bit, I'm curious because it's a memoir and it's about your memories. Mm-hmm. How do you balance the making sure that this is like factually accurate versus this is my perception of what happened? When is it important to be more subjective or when is it more important to be objective? Oh, that's good. That's a very, that's the, that is a critical question in writing nonfiction. The, the, so I have to play journalist. I have to play researcher. I write a piece, but 
I have to research things to make it work. Like in that story, I, I had to know how many seats there were to get that right. I, I, I didn't know it was the shortest air flight <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> But I found out concurrently that it had that, that that same little island has the largest geode you, you can go and stand inside of. And I've done that, you know. So the nonfiction element means that it's rooted in what, what's real and factual and actual. It's what, how that stuff comes into play. To, 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 do, to make the memoir fly, to make it work, it has to be grounded in something that's true. I have to get enough fact. I have to set something up. It's like the story about my grandmother and the kids out in the alley. It was one of the hardest pieces I ever wrote. One of the hardest pieces I ever wrote because it was, it was a, it was a memory I had. My, my brother doesn't remember it, doesn't remember it at all, but it was so critical to like, where am I? I had to find on maps where my grandmother's house was. I was really, really young when she died. So I had to research a lot of that stuff. You know, here's where we were. I remembered what the alley looked like. I could remember the actuality of the, um, the door with the chicken wire on it. Because people had chickens in those days, raised them in their backyards. You know? So yeah, there has to be the reality. Uh, I had a lot of research uh, in the croissant story about locating and finding the name of that bakery. And then I did research on the... Uh, Chateau de Tourelles, which is where it's set. When I start writing and I just, I just get what I want to do, but then I'm, I have to do the research to, to be solid on it. Um, that story from that cookbook about how the croissant got its name is just beautiful. And that's a beautiful book, by the way. Buy a copy for yourself. Tell someone, put it on your Christmas list. It's, it's the story of food, okay? There's a recipe in there and like uh, how to cook a dog if your city's under siege. Seriously, it's hilarious. But I got, I remember reading that whole thing and going, okay, I'm putting this in. And I thought, how did, how did that get from Hungary to France? And I'm going, oh God, word of mouth. What else could it be? Because I couldn't find anything factual. So it allowed me to, to set that joke up. You know, I set that up because... That would be the logical question someone would ask because I couldn't find any answer to it. So let's play a little bit. It's all about taste. And then Gabby, from your perspective, how do you as the editor balance that? Like if there's something that, uh, I don't know if this happens in Robert's book, but in general, if there's something where how you remember it is different than how it actually happened. And as an editor, how do you decide like which one is more important to the story? Yeah, I think just kind of, pointing out all those things is what's most important. Yeah. Um, because if we notice something, we as the editors won't know how important or unimportant that detail might be, the author will know that. So I think um, pointing those things out regardless of whether like, I always get this little voice in my head that's like, is this a helpful comment? Like, do you really need to, to say that? Or is this just kind of like, are you trying to leave a lot of comments? I think just kind of, letting go of that voice and leaving a comment if you have a question is what's most important and kind of letting the author see that question and be like, nah, I don't really know if that's a change that needs to be made. I think this is what's more important or letting them be like, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that this might be a problem. Maybe I'll take a second look at that. So just kind of leaving a comment regardless and kind of drawing attention to that detail is what's most important. That's one of those negotiations in it though. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it's creative nonfiction. Nonfiction mm -hmm. can be a very almost academic writing and creative nonfiction can be very much at play. And so to get this, I have to give this. So there's a lot of exchanging going on or hitting that point where you're going, I can, I, I would do this based on these three things. I would do this based on these three. And then it's, it's some of those, this is interesting, a very interesting point because I found that when it made a book, I had to approach things I did in some of the individual stories when they were individual stories that were going out to journals for publication. The body of work established for me a sense of, I can take out some of the factual stuff here because this story's here, it's gonna bounce off these other three stories. <laughs> or I could set something up at one time and go, I only need to give this much of the data right here because it's, gonna sh it, it's necessary later and I can get data relevant to this story here and then later do it over here. And it was like, 
it was almost liberating to me because I, you know, um, but that's an, that's an interesting negotiation on making a manuscript. How do the pieces fit together? How do they talk to each other? Where am I repeating? Where can I put something in that like that work there, I can reference that here and ping to something else for the reader. But that's a poetic technique I do, that, that I bring to putting a, a collection like this together because in, in a book of poetry, I do that all the time. I look at I look at word I make word lists of repeated words and the colors I use and and so many things and then as I'm reading through uh, I can look and go oh I can I can make that metaphor richer by setting it up and using this word because that pings off these other things here um, it's like stitching things together in in the end of it and so all those questions about where the negotiations are they're negotiated differently in the individual pieces, but you can renegotiate. It's like renegotiating your contract here for the 2021 season. It's like, you know, a baseball player. Um, but that's the bookmaking. I feel in this book by working with this terrific team that you, you guys all are, is that I think of all the choices I finally made, I'm completely settled with. And that's a really satisfying experience to go forth on. And I did spell wells correctly and 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 dick Haig also sent me a note that said the jameson we drink we spelled differently robert <laughs> and, he, and in that too he was right <laughs> well your book is truly beautiful and i'm so excited that people will be able to read it really soon yeah me too me too and I think with that, we're, I, we've been having such a good conversation. Time just flies by, but if there's anything else that you two would like to talk about briefly before we sign off. Oh my gosh. I, I'm, I'm clocked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been such a good conversation. I'm oh, so yes. happy to have both of you on. Um, Gabby, thank you again for coming back on. I'm sure thank we'll- you. Yeah, I'm sure we'll talk to you again in the future. <laughs> and Robert, it was so nice meeting you officially and yeah. getting to talk about your book. And I'm sure that people will love to hear all of the things that you both have had to say. This was great. This was a great conversation, which mm -hmm. is what I always think these kind of events should be. And um, I'm, I'm coming away with more thoughts about things, which is good. I feel like it, it's jarred some things, which is, which is good. So thank you. Thank you both. And thank you again. Thank you. Once again, we just want to thank Robert so much for coming on to the podcast and for writing an amazing book. We had a wonderful discussion and thank you to Gabby as well. And now we will get to hear Robert read the story that we were discussing, My Valdemar Carr. I'm Robert Milner. I'm going to be reading from my book, Ohio Apertures, and the selection I'll be reading is entitled My Valdemar Carr. A hard rain is coming furiously down on the windshield. Even with the car wipers at top speed, I can barely see the taillights of the cars in front of me. I'm driving my Datsun B210 on Interstate 90 West, ready to exit at Clifton Boulevard in Cleveland. Regular rain on the roof sounds like hail, so this thunderstorm sounds like an avalanche of golf balls. I'm entombed in a deafening, dark, gray box. Looking into the blinding shower for the exit sign, I see a large blue-black rectangle tangle suddenly rise up from the road. What's this? It's a flying wet carpet of death. It wants to wrap me like a mummy. When it lands my windshield, the wipers stop, making a straining and dying whirring sound. I can't see a thing. My heart alternates between beating and stomping. You murderous piece of steel, I shout at the car. Are you trying to kill me? The wipers hum in reply. I turn the wheel to the right, to the berm, and put both feet on the brake as the car leaves the highway and slides onto the soggy grass. The engine stalls. I catch my breath. The sound the car makes is like sarcastic laughter. In the mid-1970s, Dotson marketed the B210 Sunny in North America as a lightweight, sporty little hatchback with a four-speed that got almost 50 miles per gallon on the highway. I bought mine used as a drive-to-work car to get to school. The car was as green as a plastic toy frog. Back near the gas cap was a small yellow honeybee decal 
smiling and accompanied by ellipsis-like dashes, both B and Carr, by association, were flying happily along. Embarrassed by the bizarre, mesmerizing color and cartoonish B, I considered dinging the B with another car, just enough to get my insurance company to pay for a repair and a repaint. My deductible had been lower. I'd have done it. Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Facts in the Case of Monsieur Valdemar, was published simultaneously in December of 1845, both in the American Review and the Broadway Journal, which Poe himself edited. The narrator is a mesmerist, known only as capital P, who uses magnetism to hypnotize Ernest Valdemar, a writer at the very moment of his death from tuberculosis. P suspends Valdemar in a hypnagogic state, the threshold of consciousness between waking and sleeping, a lucid dream state in which Valdemar is aware that he is dreaming but is not really dead. For seven months, Valdemar's body is cold, pale, bluish, still. Yet he speaks, P says, as if from a vast distance. I'm dying, Valdemar states. Let me die. But P is ever the scientist, so the experiment continues. Valdemar keeps asking to die until one day Valdemar claims that he's actually dead. In an attempt to speak with a dead man, P breaks the spell and, and this is a Poe story, remember, all seven months of existing in a suspended state instantaneously catch up with Valdemar. He liquefies and splashes to the floor. But the gruesome ending shot Poe's readers. Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote to Poe, praising his ability to make horrible improbabilities seem familiar. And Poe had surprisingly published the piece not as a work of fiction, but as a scientific hoax, sort of a 19th century predecessor to the Orson Welles 1938 radio broadcast of his adaptation of the H.G. Wells 1898 novel, The War of the Worlds. Both of these men were berated for duping their respective audiences. Yet, Residual anger over Poe's hope remains to this day, refusing to die. Two design flaws in the B-210 always tricked me. The first was the lousy shock absorbers that turned the car into a rocking horse when I had to brake quickly. The other was the erratic ignition. I'd put the key in and turn it, but nothing would happen. I'd take the key out and put it back in and treat it again. Nothing. Again I'd try, and the B-210 would respond. Let me die, it would say. I'm dead, it would say. Returning, running late for work as usual, I habitually set a ceramic cup of hot coffee on the roof of the car while I was loading my briefcase and my book bag into the back seat before driving away. As I accelerated up the street, I'd hear the cup sliding toward the back of the car, followed by a short second when the cup was suspended in air. Then I'd hear the crash, the splash, the mess. The young woman from Lorraine and her brother return from test driving my Datsun with the taped to the inside window piece of cardboard announcing, Car for sale, all offers considered. Her hands clutch below her throat, wide-eyed in wonder of the little honeybee of a car. Her brother shakes his head in disbelief at the totally shitty shocks. They walk a few feet away near the coffee stains on the street to talk. Her hand points now and then to the car. He stands solid, feet spread, arms folded across his chest. They walk back and the brother pulls hundred dollar bills from his shirt pocket and sets them on the hood of the Datsun. The color of the money blurs into the green finish of the car so that I can only distinguish the difference by the small rug-like shape of the bills. The girl gets into the driver's side, clicks her seatbelt, and turns to her brother in the passenger seat with a big smile. When she puts the key in the ignition, it starts right up. They drive smoothly down the street, the car buzzing along like a honeybee. This former hoax of a car that once begged to expire seems to be suddenly sprite and young and joyous. 
No coffee cup crashes and dies on the street behind it. You feel duped. Thank you once again, everyone, for listening and tuning into the Cornerstone podcast this month. Once again, I'm Claire, and I'm your host. And as a reminder, you can always go onto our website and buy any of our books directly from us. The link for that is uwsp.edu slash English slash cornerstone slash pages slash cornerstone press dot ASPX. And from there, you can purchase any of our books directly from us. And once again, just a reminder to follow us on social media on YouTube, where you can listen to this podcast every month and on Instagram and on Facebook. Once again, thank you for tuning in and thank you again to Robert Miltner and Gabby McClung for having a wonderful discussion with me today. I'll see you all next time.